Good evening. We're on the air again with another edition of Patience on the News. And I have a great guest tonight because he knows how to do this. His <laughs> name is Bill Nimitz. Everybody in Maine knows Bill Nimitz, a great columnist for the newspapers. And uh, uh, he would make some people angry from time to time. Bill, did you hear from those people that you made angry? Oh, very often. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Haven't lately, though. I, I, uh, Monday was the, the first anniversary of my retirement. Oh, it was? It was. And I woke up that morning and said, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. this, isn't, this isn't how retirement's supposed to go, but here I am. Anyway, uh, he became an institution in Maine. I first met Bill. Did you start as a sports writer? No, I started as a uh, cub reporter for the Morning Sentinel in Waterville. Actually, if you go back to my very first days when I was at, in college, I did a sports writing internship. So I guess, yes, I did. Did, you, I, did you go to BC? No, I went to, I went to UMass Amherst. Yeah. And prior to that, a Catholic high school, Severian Brothers High School. Severian Brothers. Uh, Where's that, in Needham? West, Westwood, Massachusetts. Westwood. I grew up in Needham, but it was you, you two towns in, over. Yeah. No, I remember. I actually met you. I ran. You, were you? You were here in nineteen. You were in Waterville in nineteen eighty. I was at the Augusta Civic Center in nineteen eighty when you were running for Congress. I know when I was the was uh, it, oh, chairman of the Democratic Party. Oh, I thought you. And were then running. I ran for Congress okay. that year. Yes, that's but, right. But uh, uh, Bill, you're one of the few people that know that for that one year, nineteen eighty, Maine was first in the country in terms of its caucuses, ahead of Iowa, mm -hmm. and. All the candidates came. Jimmy Carter was yep. the incumbent. He couldn't come, but he was on the phone. Jody Powell was there. Jody Powell mm -hmm. was there. Uh, uh, Jerry Brown was yep. there. Yep. Teddy Kennedy was there. Mm -hmm. And those guys spent at least two weeks in Maine. That's right. And I remember that the night, uh, probably the night of the caucuses, I remember. Uh, that's the, probably when you and I first met. Yeah. And there you were with Jody Powell and... I know, Jerry it, Brown, and it, I said, who's this hotshot Harold Patience? <laughs> yeah. Who is this guy? We were the center of the political world that there one day. There you go. Our moment in the sun. And it only happened once. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, we're not here to talk about ancient history, and it is ancient. Um, we're here to talk about a column that uh, Bill wrote very recently, and uh, he said it was a call to action to preserve local journalism in Maine. And it was about the establishment of the Maine Journalism Foundation, a nonprofit, as he described it, determined to sustain and nurture Maine's reputation as a bastion for independent local news. And you are the president of the I Maine am. Journalism Foundation. So why do we need a Maine Journalism Foundation? Two reasons. Uh, there's one is very is immediate, and that is that uh, if you live in southern, central, western Maine, uh, and you read a daily or weekly newspaper, uh, local newspaper, on a regular basis, then you are probably reading a newspaper that is owned by Masthead Maine, which is a company that is, was formed by Reed Brower, Camden, who purchased uh, our, the the Press Herald and uh, the and the Central Maine Morning Sentinel, the KJ, and uh, from uh, Donald Sussman back in 2015. Reed, these are the 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 the, the legacy is the Gannett newspapers. Correct. The, the Gannett exactly yeah. the Gannett newspapers, and uh, Reed has been a great steward. And, and in the in addition to that, he then went on to acquire the Lewiston Sun Journal, the uh, Brunswick Times Record and a slew of weekly papers, uh, that some of which were already affiliated with those dailies, to the point where Masthead in Maine is now a collection of five daily newspapers, and depending on how you count them, up to 25 weekly newspapers. So uh, it's all but one of the daily newspapers that's correct. in Maine. The Bangor Daily News is the only one. Is the only one. The only one. So it, we have to be unique in Maine in that respect. We are more than unique in that respect. In fact, Maine is the only state in the country right now in which there is not outside chain ownership of a single newspaper. The Any only state in the United newspaper. States? That's correct. We, this is a pristine news ecosystem, yeah. that's what we'd like to call it, in, yeah. in that everything is independently owned, and the more independently owned and the more local that ownership is, the more attuned it is to the, not only the pulse of the community, but the needs of the community, and, and a commitment to the community. 
So we're at a crossroads right now because Reed, as many people know, uh, recently uh, announced his intention to get on to the next phase of his life. And, you know, being a guy who just retired a year ago, I can I, I understand. I mean, in fact, Reed went to UMass at the same time I was there. Same time? Yeah, we didn't know each other, but he sold pizza in my dorm. I found, out, <laughs> I found this out 40 years later. I, he was the Bell's Pizza guy. Uh, but anyway, he wants to... Uh, he wants to move on, but he wants to do it in an orderly, responsible way. So he made it known, uh, well, we picked up, uh, myself and my fellow foundation members, Emily Barr from Cape Elizabeth, who is a former uh, CEO of the Graham Media Group with the Washington Post. What do you mean, the uh, Graham Media Group? Is that all the, broad, the broadcast, broadcast division of the Washington Post? Correct, correct. Was, uh, uh, TV's a big, in bunch big of TV markets? TV stations, that's right, Chicago, uh, yeah, you know, those she ran it. That she she ran that division, and she run, lives in Maine. She now? lives in Cape Elizabeth right now, and uh, and she is a pro on this stuff. I have to tell you. And then we have Bill Burke, who, uh, f you know, formerly uh, own, former owner of the Sea Portland Sea Dogs, and of course, uh, going back to the founding of the Weather Channel, and his, he has a very extensive broadcast background himself, and uh, and is a great fundraiser. I mean, he he. he directed the uh, Maine Medical Center's uh, fundraising campaign, was very successful at that. So we coalesced around a simple idea uh, when we heard that Reed was planning on moving on, and that was the news market right now is such that when it comes to uh, newspaper acquisitions, it's very often a uh, not a pretty sight. There are, there are some very predatory in fact, the, the, the acquisition market is mostly populated right now. The only people buying are uh, come at these things with a very predatory strategy, and that is that they're, they're back, they're hedge funds, they're venture capitalists, they want to pull as much cash out of the operation as quickly as they can to get those instant returns for their investors on this, this purchase. What that means typically in a lot of markets is the first thing they do is sell all the real estate. If there's a building, if there's a press, whatever it might be, they sell, they sell it and lease back. Uh, they get pulled cash that way. And then they go after, much more significantly to us, they go after the operating costs, which, as we know, in any newspaper is the newsroom. That's where... Is the people who... The people who make, produce who, it. Who, who make the phone calls, who dig out there things, who look at the documents and who report Go to it. that town hall, go to that city hall. Yeah when maybe no one else is there and pay close attention to what's on the agenda, what they're talking about. If they go into executive session to talk about things behind, you know, behind closed doors, those reporters are the ones who are challenging them, saying, we want to know why you're doing that. You have to follow the right to know law. Without those sentries, if you will, a lot of these towns, we, they do now even go uncovered and not only does it remove that watchdog role that the, the press typically plays with government? But beyond that, it leaves the community in the dark, uninformed as to what's going on until it's too late. What, what's this development going on down the street here? We didn't hear anything about that. Oh, sorry, contract's been signed. It's all, zoning board has approved it, planning board passed off on it. Nobody knew. So the, the, what we're saying is when, a, when an operation like that comes in, and guts these news staffs, it's too late for the community at that point to do anything about it. They're in the dark, and, and it, that in turn has ripple effects on the community. It, people start going to their respective silos for information that is sometimes vetted, sometimes not. Rumors take root about things that aren't substantiated, but as we've seen in the past few years, it becomes fact overnight. And the next thing you know, we have what we have seen, you've seen it, I've seen it on TV here in Maine, even here in Maine in recent months, where you have these, these what were once municipal board or school board meetings that turn into absolute free-for-alls. We have police being called. We have elected officials being escorted out to their cars because they're afraid of the people who came to this meeting. And this is all, this all breeds on that misinformation and that lack of a, lack of an, a, a starting set of facts on which everybody can base their opinions. Uh, so we feel like the Masthead Maine newspapers right now are a, uh, they're a profitable business. 
They're doing fine. And what we want to do is more proactive than reactive. We want to acquire them from Reed, own them as a nonprofit, uh, diversify their revenue streams, uh, that be it through digital innovation, but also through, you know, to some extent philanthropy, which nonprofits can do, and just get, 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 get Mainers to realize, number one, how lucky they are, and number two, how they now have an opportunity to protect that and to buy into this and to start treating newspapers not as a private business that's in business only to make money, but as a public service that is in business to inform the public and strengthen the, de the democracy. We take all this for granted, don't we? We sure do. We sure do. You said something interesting, uh, and I made a note about it. <clears throat> Starting with the same bare, base of facts, I, one thing about having a, your own newspaper in town that's local, that covers the local news, uh, that <clears throat> the discussions on the street are what we're all reading in the same newspaper. There you go. Uh, we, re we read something in your column or we read something in the Press Herald and then we say to one another on the street or in the grocery store, did you see, mm -hmm. did you read about mm -hmm. this? That's and right. we're talking about the same thing. Right. When these predators come in and squeeze it dry and leave a skeleton, we're not talking about no. the same thing. You're talking uh, about what you read on your Facebook page versus what they read on theirs yeah. or Twitter, whatever. and. Those aren't the same things. You know, those, it's not that same starting point. Not the same starting point. It's like, I think it's analogous to what television was like when I was a young man. We had three networks, and at 6 p.m. or 6.30, you watched either the evening news on either CBS, ABC, mm -hmm. or NBC. Walter Cronkite, well, David Brinkley, Chet Huntley, or Harry Reasoner. Right. Harry Reasoner. Yeah, yeah. So there were three guys on delivering the news, and uh, so... At least a third of us were watching the same thing, and everybody was, they, they were pretty much straight in That's terms right. of the news. That's right. That's so right. Uh, we, were, we were having discussions mm -hmm. based on facts. And you know, that doesn't mean, we're not talking about groupthink here. What I'm saying, and you know, I'm, I mean, I was an opinion guy for much of my, the, certainly the latter half of my journalism career. So I understand the whole, you know, opinion side right. of the media. But what, what it did was, as people formulate their own opinions, they're rooted in the same set of facts. And so as a result, you get a much healthier debate because everybody's using the same And then they have points. different opinions on that group, of, on, that, exactly, on those facts. Exactly. I mean, you know, you have people who start out, for example, with the premise, without any proof, evidence, anything, that the last presidential election was stolen. And that's their starting point. It's very difficult for somebody who, who rightfully believes that not to be true to embark on an intelligent discussion of the facts with those people. You know, so that's, that's a, just one of example of the kind of breakdown, the kind of tearing at the community fabric that takes place when people start operating with what they think are different facts or different truth. You know, I'm a lawyer, and in a way, I'm in the same business that you journalists are in, for the most part, mm -hmm. uh, and that is evidence. That's right. Uh, lawyers, stock and trade is getting evidence, finding evidence, digging it out, uh, cross-examining people, mm -hmm. asking a lot of questions, and our whole system of justice depends on evidence. That's right. And if evidence is impure and a joke, we have no system it of corrupts justice. Corrupts that system. It's mm -hmm. gone. Mm -hmm. It's we're at each other's throats, and there is no system yep. in which we can get along. So it's the same thing with reporters. It is. It is. People think that you know you don't realize, and I, over the years I, I've always been struck by how many times uh, something that is so rudimentary to me, which is the news gathering. Uh, writing, editing, and, and production, all the, whole pro all, the, all the things that go into the news product. Uh, it's a complex process. And if you live it like I have for so many years, you just kind of take it for granted because that's just 
your routine. But when you explain it to people, when you explain the vetting that occurs between the, the editor and the reporter at the assignment stage, uh, between the reporter and his or her fellow reporters during the reporting stage, between the reporter and the sources, then comes the writing, then it goes back to the content editor, and from the content editor it goes on to a copy editor, and then that goes on to a page, and that page gets proofed, and all the way along that st process, there are people who, yes, they're looking for typos or you know, the, the, the nuts and bolts stuff, but at the same time, anybody along that chain is not only authorized, but is required if they see some flaw, some hole, something that, some evidence that doesn't line up to sound the alarm, say, wait, we gotta wait, we gotta fix this. So by the time that paper hits your doorstep in the morning, that many eyes have been on it. That's a pretty thorough vetting process for an eight inch story about the town council. And what happens with, when you, when you turn all that over to you know, the social media food fights that we now have every day, none of that happens. It's one person sitting down at a keyboard saying, I heard this, this is true, sends it, 10 people read it, three of them think it's true too, they put it out and boom, boom, boom. There it and goes. without strong local journalism, all we've got left is the social media content. And it's, it's I call it the babble. The babble. That's really what it is. And, mm -hmm. and that's what we'll have. Yeah. So let's go, go back and talk sure. about Maine Journalism mm -hmm. Foundation. So the idea is to have Maine Journalism Foundation, a nonprofit, acquire these newspaper properties. That's right. That's our, that's our primary goal right now because uh, if only because it's imminent and we know that we need to we need yeah, to you say it's imminent. We're, we're, we're talking not a long time no, from now. No, no. Actually, in, it, it, the, in terms of our immediate goals, we're talking weeks, not months. And, uh, you know, we need to, our objective right now is to get a legitimate seat at that table when, when Reed Brower starts entertaining offers from uh, buyers. We want... The predators will be at the oh, table. They, yeah, we, they will. Yeah. And we, uh, we assume, you know, I don't know yeah. that for a fact right now, but I, I'm a, we have to operate under that assumption. And we want, and we have had wonderful discussions with Reed. And I think Reed, he, he completely understands what we're about. And I think he also understands that uh, we, talked to, we talked about the Guy Gannett legacy, and, uh, and I'll get to that in a minute because Guy's granddaughter, Maddie Corson, is helping us lead this charge. But Reed understands the, uh, the whole idea. In fact, he used the word stewardship when he made his announcement. He said he, he didn't refer to himself as the owner, he said, I, I've, I've been the steward of these properties. And I love the sound of that because it, it, it plugs into that concept of public service. So we think he's at least somewhat philosophically aligned or, or understanding of what we're trying to do. But we need to, we need to be competitive. And you know we need to financially, correct, in other words, correct. Y yeah, you you got to have some money to put exactly. it on the table. So our goal, I'll, I'll sketch it out for you. Our goal, our overall goal, is to raise fifteen million dollars, and that money would be used for two purposes. One is the acquisition, and if we're successful in reaching that amount, there would be a, a working amount left over that would be used in two ways. One is to uh, you know, look at the places in the uh, in the dailies and these weeklies that could use some shoring up, uh, particularly in the digital realm. We really need to be out in front <coughs> on that, which in and of, in itself uh, opens up new various revenue streams <coughs> for the whole operation. Uh, that's not to say we're getting rid of the paper, the newspaper. Maine demographically skews older, and we are well aware of how many older, loyal readers we have who want that newsprint in the morning, and we, we, we respect that completely. Uh, so part of it's acquisition, part of it is what I call walking around money, you know, once we're in, in that position of uh, ownership. But there's so you're walking around money, you, you, you mean money to, to ensure journalist, quality journalism exactly. outside of the newspaper. Exactly. exactly, and that's the next step is to we see ourselves as a statewide organization, and there are some uh, nonprofit 
news organizations here in Maine right now. The Maine Monitor is a big one up, up in Augusta, and they have done And they do investigative work. journalism, yeah. too. They right? do a ton of it. That's really what they do. And uh, in-depth stuff. They've got a great stable of uh, young reporters. Who, and, you know, I, I look, it reminds me of the old Statehouse Press Corps when I was, you know, doing that kind of thing myself. And it's, it's, it, it warms my heart to see these young, young journalists uh, doing what they do. We have some local little papers. Harpswell Anchor is a tiny town, a tiny town of Harpswell that they lost their paper. They were in a news desert, meaning they had nothing. And a group of people in the town got together and uh, through their hard work and donations, they now have an almost two-year-old weekly newspaper that is operating well in the black. They're about to hire, they hired a full-time editor, they're about to hire a full-time reporter. So you can see in microcosm, people want their news and they're willing to step forward and, and pay for it so and support it. So in addition to the acquisition, our goal is to support that kind of journalism throughout the state. And that can be through uh, grants, targeted grants to news organizations. It could be toward funding uh, beat reporters, if you will, in areas that need more coverage like climate change, uh, social equity, education particularly when it comes to civics, I will stress. I mean, I think we've fallen way short in educating our young people about just how the system works, let alone how to get involved in it. Uh, so we see, so that's our long range mission. And our short range mission is to use uh, the uh, Masthead Maine acquisition as kind of a catapult into that, where we will become a, a clearinghouse for, for local journalism support throughout Maine. So. There's a lot of people watching us t tonight who say, I hope they can raise the 15 million and, uh, you know, I can help them with the 25 bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll take it. And here's yeah. why. <laughs> we are we are looking for, for you know, the, the, the big donations. We all know that that's what this is going to take. You're not going to do you're not going to do one million, let alone 15 million on twenty five dollar donations. However, two things. Number one, uh, we launched this just a little over a week ago. We've got over 300 donors online, and they're coming in. And I've noticed the donations are actually getting bigger and bigger, which is very heartening. Uh, but it's the numbers that are important, too. We're going to be reaching out. We actually we are, we have already begun reaching out. I'm going to be having a Zoom call tomorrow with a major journalism foundation nationally. Uh, just to kind of start laying the groundwork for what we're doing, we, that's a process, so we don't expect it to happen real quick. But the first question they ask every time is, what do you have for local support? They are not interested in investing in news markets where people don't give a hoot. If the locals aren't stepping up, these why people... Should they? Why should why they? Why should they? Yeah. You know? And so what, what I'm saying to, to you folks out there who want to help us but feel like, oh, I can only do a little. A little is a lot, not only in terms of dollars, but in terms of numbers of people who not only care, and there's a big difference between people who care and people who care enough to pull out their wallet and whatever it is. How would somebody be, uh, get, get their address or whatever? Just type in on the computer, Maine Journalism Foundation? Uh, no, actually, it's, just go to our website. It's mainejournalism.org. Mainejournalism.org. And that will tell you a little bit more about us. It'll give you some bios on, on you know, myself, uh, Emily, and Bill. And it will have that donate button, which will take you to a fundraising, you know, website where you can yeah. click on and uh, give whatever, whatever you feel you can. So this, uh, th we're not unique. I mean, this has happened all across oh. the country. And there are news deserts all over the yes. United States. Right. And it's a serious problem. It is. And you're trying to ensure, prevent this. Exactly. From being I see it as a, it's, it's, a, it's a binary choice when a news market is threatened. You can go one way, which is the <clears throat> nonprofit route, which has taken root in places like Baltimore, Philadelphia, Chicago, Salt Lake City, Texas, California, New Jersey. I could go on. And these are all very specific examples. These are areas where people said the only way to save and preserve local journalism is a nonprofit. Correct. And they're, and they're, they're doing well. So this is, 
this is a phenomenon. I'd love to say I invented this idea, yeah. Harold, but, but I didn't. You but know, but, it came but, to me. but, but yeah. it's a phenomenon. It we're, is. And we're confronted with this nationally. It is. No question about it. Uh, what's interesting about Maine is if we, if we are successful, I know, much like the outside chain ownership, I know of no journalism foundation in existence right now which would have, have the statewide scope that we would. So in terms of our breadth, I think we would immediately stand out nationally as a model for, you know, this can go beyond your hometown. This doesn't have to be Portland. This doesn't have to be Lewiston or Waterville or Augusta or Rumford or, or wherever. Uh, this can be, you know, we, we talk about Maine being one big small town, one, one yeah. community. This, this would be the best illustration of that I could imagine if people all over Maine got together and said, we may not agree on everything, but we can all agree on one thing. We value our local news, and we are willing collectively to come forward and make that statement by supporting it financially. I want to talk some about, like, I know a little bit about the Baltimore nonprofit. Mm -hmm. uh, but be, before I do, uh, I want to ask you, I, I printed off an article that I read, a, a, a column you did some time ago about the school payroll oh. scandal. In, that was in December, I believe. In, in yeah. de, well, I looked up. December 7th, mm -hmm. Pearl Harbor Day. You, you launched this column. How apropos. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> I, I, needed to, I needed to cut loose, so why not? Why not that day? But as, essentially, this story is about how the Portland School Board was screwing up the payroll. Things were, things were not good at the Portland School Board. And would have continued to be not good, except somebody began to shine the light on exactly. it. Exactly. And put the flashlight and say, wait a minute, folks, something's going on, and it's involving millions of dollars. That's right. Of your and a lot of people's livelihoods. And a lot of people's mm -hmm. livelihoods. So you, you and the newspaper shined a light on it. Well, I've I shown it rather... Uh, uh, I, I certainly wasn't at the vanguard of that, and the credit for that goes to the Press Herald, and in particular, uh, the Press Herald's uh, education reporter, Lana Cohen, who was relatively new to the Press Herald <coughs> newsroom. And I remember what it's like to come into a city where, you know, you're the new reporter, and you know, you're you're walking into these meetings, and it's, it's, it can be a very daunting process, especially when, uh, you know, the powers that be are as as entrenched as as they were in this particular case. She caught wind of this, and she started digging and digging and started writing. And the more she wrote, the more pushback she got, to the point where the superintendent and school board chair were not, had, had publicly announced their intent to not respond to her calls, to not answer her questions. She was shut out. Which and is essentially shutting out the people. Exactly. And she persisted. And God bless her for doing it. Because... When it, the harder she worked, there's always, you know, the truth will out. People in those positions think they can put a lid on it, and it's, and it's not going to get out. But once people out there knew that this young reporter was working on this story, they started coming. People would the start calling her. The back door, the roof, whatever. And she started getting the story from other sources. And she reported it beautifully to the point where... Uh, well, as it was reaching its climax, I, I was watching this from, you know, Geezerville, having been retired for seven months, and I was just standing up and cheering. And I, and I was also at that point, of course, involved with this initiative. So I thought, wow, if this isn't an example of why it's important to have a vigilant hometown newspaper watching these things, I don't know what is. So I wrote that column saying to people, look at this. This is what's at stake here. This is why we do what we do. And this is why, whether you realize it every day or not, that paper is so important to your life. And as we know, the end, the uh, superintendent is now gone. The, the, uh, there's been new leadership on the school board. And they're still trying to sort it out. <laughs> Last I heard, I don't know. I, I, they're closer to a resolution, I'm sure. But all of that would have happened outside the public view no and one would have known about this. Except the for public. these unhappy school employees yeah. whose paychecks were going completely <clears throat> on them. And where else would they have turned? So that's what you're trying to prevent. And I want to emphasize 
the importance of it. Not that it needs to be emphasized for our audience, because they, they understand. Sure. They're watching a new, a somewhat of a news yeah, show we, right now. We have a motivated group of yeah, people. Yeah, no, it's true. Yeah. It's true. They pay attention, yeah. all of them. Different political views, of course. but they yep. pay attention. And I want to invoke uh, the words of Judge Louis Brandeis, uh, a early and mm -hmm. mid 20th century justice, federal judge, who had, I think, the best quote for me. I've always remembered it. Uh, and it's something that I hope sticks with everybody in the context of this discussion, what Bill's talking about. Brandeis once wrote in an opinion a very simple phrase. He said, the best disinfectant, the best disinfectant infectant is sunlight. Sunlight, that's right. And that's what we're talking about. Will there be sunlight in our local mm -hmm. coverage of events, or will there be darkness? Or as the Washington Post puts it, democracy dies in darkness. Dies Same in point. darkness. Yeah. So what you're talking about is disinfectant. Exactly, exactly. And, you know, it's... It's that, and it's also just communication. I mean, this does, it doesn't always have to be, you know, the Woodward and Bernstein School of Journalism to justify a newspaper's existence. It's the high school sports. Where else are you going to get that? It's the local, the, 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 the Portland Symphony. It's the arts. It's, it's so many aspects of our life that one way or another are reflected and reported in the newspaper. It's, it's the lifeblood. It's the community glue. There you go. Exactly. It's the catalyst. Holds everybody together. It's the catalyst that pulls yep. the community exactly. together. And, and we're talking about it may go. It may. And this, I guess I feel like the, uh, you, know, you know, the sky is falling <laughs> in the yeah. morning. But it's true. I mean, it, and it's, there's, just, there's not a lot of time, but there's time for Maine to step up and say, we don't want that to happen to us. And uh, that's, that's really, in its essence, why we're here, uh, why we're doing this. Now, you're a little bit different than Baltimore. Tell us, tell us what happened in Baltimore uh, mm -hmm. is that the, the nonprofit that was created is competing with the newspaper. It's really, yeah, and that's what we're trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what happened in Baltimore is there was an attempt to, uh, to, to take the Baltimore Sun nonprofit. And unfortunately, uh, it, that attempt failed. Yeah, it's a long story, but I'll just suffice it to say it didn't work out. And those people who were most committed to the nonprofit model, one of whom I believe you're acquainted with, well, uh, were, you were acquainted with. a great with. friend of yeah, mine, yeah. yeah. Uh, Ted, uh, he, Ted they, Venatoulis. Yeah, they, uh, they said, okay, we're going to strike out our own and we're going to start what is an online newspaper called the Baltimore Banner. And they're doing quite well, but it's a startup. And a startup comes with a lot of challenges and uphill climbs that you don't see in a, in a transaction like this one where you're assuming ownership you're, of an you're ongoing, buying a, a, ongoing, a, a, ongoing operation. Ongoing right. operation. But, they've, uh, but the, the, the interesting thing that's happened is what everybody feared with the sun has happened. There was that, you know, Finally right everybody. Away. And now there is a very well-worn path of very seasoned, very good professional journalists from the Baltimore Sun newsroom to the Baltimore Banner newsroom. To so, the nonprofit. Correct. And so they're, they're kind of Reestablishing a new beachhead, if you will, under the under the banner of this nonprofit, and I think that I think in view of that and in view of the support they have from the community, I think they're going to do pretty well. I really do. Ted Venatoulis, I, is the the owner of the new startup newspaper, is the Venatoulis Institute, a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. Ted Venatoulis, I knew back in the '60s. In Washington, you knew everybody. Well, in the I knew 60s him because it was very rather. <laughs> Washington was kind of a small town then, yeah. and yeah. and Venatoulis was the chief aide to a congressman from Maryland. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a Greek name. I had a Greek name. There you go. Well, we became great friends. I'll also tell you this. This is kind of interesting. He grew up in Baltimore, son of Greek immigrants, and his best friend was the mayor's son, Delisandro, Tommy Delisandro. Tommy D'Alessandro's daughter is Nancy Pelosi. 
So when Nancy Pelosi go. was a high school student at a Catholic high school in Baltimore, th this guy was dating her. Oh, boy. This guy was dating her. So I thought things like that only happened in Maine. Yeah, right. and, and, and it, of course, they've remained great lifelong yeah. friends. Yeah. I first met Nancy Pelosi before she ever went to Congress mm -hmm. through Ted Venatoulis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But in any event, Venatoulis says he found a wealthy guy who was community-oriented, a guy named Bainham. Mm -hmm. And Bainham had the money. Yep. And Venatoulis had the desire and the right. drive. Yep. And Bainham said, I'm going to make this happen with my money and your vision, Ted. And he did. And, mm -hmm. and Ted Venatoulis said a couple of very interesting things that are applicable here, and, and particularly for this audience that's watching. He said one time, if a community loses its sports team or uh, uh, loses, you know, they, uh, they go away or they, mm -hmm. they never got Which there. Which we've seen a lot with the NFL oh, and the, the franchises. The teams move yeah, around. Sure. He said, then it loses its spirit somehow. It erodes the community spirit mm -hmm. to lose the sports team. And he said, if a community loses its newspaper, it loses its soul. Ah. And he said... We fight, Ted said, we fight to get local sports teams into our communities or fight to keep them there That's right. when others want to take them away. He said, and it's time to fight to keep God our local him. newspapers. God bless them. It's time yeah. to fight mm -hmm. to keep our local newspapers. So uh, he, and then he added, we're, in, to the people in Baltimore, we're not second rate, and we don't want to be second rate. And I think that fired people yeah, up. Yeah, I think it does. Well, he's invoking the same kind of passion that people feel around sports. It's an emotional attachment that they have to their sports teams. And, and you know, it's easy to do that with sports because they win or they lose, and you laugh, or you cheer, right. or you cry. Uh, the newspaper's daily slog is what makes them so valuable to people. And it's one of those, I, in that column that I wrote just a week or so ago, yeah. uh, I, was, I was looking around for similar insp inspiration, although I loved that quote. I wish I'd known about that quote. Uh, but the Call one me that, in any time you want to quote. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. The one that came to mind that I used in the column was the quote from Joni Mitchell when she's once saying, don't it always seem to go that you don't know what you got till it's gone? And if ever a statement was true about local newspapers these days, that's it. Because in Baltimore, despite the, the, the success thus far of the banner, uh, you lose the paper, especially in communities that are still reliant on the printed hard copy paper, and you lose the press. You lose, you lose the printed product. And you lose all the infrastructure that goes into producing that and delivering it and circulate. All those things go away. And then you're left with what they did in Baltimore. If you're going to start over from scratch, you've got to do it with an online publication, which is great for a big metro area where that's a lot of what kind of that, that transition has taken place already. But in, these, in some of these smaller towns where your routine is not to go home and fire up your laptop to see what the school lunch menu is next week, what you're doing is you're walking out of the, the, the local mom and pop store and you're grabbing that newspaper with a free, usually, newspaper off the rack and flipping through it when you get home, and yeah, there's the school lunch menu, but here's the town council meeting, and here's the letter to the editor from your neighbor down the street, and oh, what did he have to say? And you have this kind of visceral experience, which I think it was what Ted was getting at. Uh, it's how you relate, how you communicate to the rest of your community. You take that away, it's not only difficult, I think in some cases it's just about impossible to recreate it in this day and age. So. For those people who value that, that micro local, that, or even in Portland, just a general regional local paper, uh, like Joni said, you won't know what you had until one day you wake up and it's gone. Joni Mitchell. Most people here are too young to know, I know. who Joni Mitchell was. I know. I just read today. Look up Big Yellow Taxi. That's the name of the song. Well, I just Big read an obituary about Gordon Lightfoot today. Oh, broke my heart. Broke your heart. Yeah. 
Yeah. And it said, because Gordon Lightfoot was, we're a little off the subject here, Gordon Lightfoot was a Canadian. He was. And yeah. so was Joni Mitchell. Exactly. Yep. Well, you knew that. Saskatchewan. That's right. She grew up this in Saskatchewan. Guy. He knew it. <laughs> there you go. So, yep. so uh, 15 million, a lot of money. Uh, it's up mm -hmm. to us yep. to find it. It is, each and every one of us. And if any of us know any very wealthy people, who have community spirit that's right and who are civic minded this is for them and if any of you uh, wealthy people are out there listening right now you know we want to talk to you come to mainjournalism.org you'll find contact information for myself my fellow board members and uh, we are engaged in in those kinds of conversations right now uh, I'm heartened to see that in the week or two since we finally went public ourselves, what previously had been outreach on our part, looking for, I, I, I equated it to looking for Bigfoot, you know he's out there, you just have to find him. And so we were engaged in that process. And I have noticed a, no, a subtle but noticeable pendulum shift since where the outreach is now starting to come our way. And we're starting to, people are coming to us instead of us going to them. So I'm. Um, I know it's a tight timeline. We need to raise, uh, short term, we really need to raise about three to five million dollars in very short order. And I'm not saying cash in hand. Uh, pledges are fine. We are in the process right now of getting our 501c3 tax exempt status. Uh, in the meantime, we're accepting donations through what's called a fiscal sponsor. It's another organization, in this case, the local media association out in Michigan is serving as our fiscal sponsor, meaning we can accept tax-deductible donations through them. But, but for the bigger fundraising effort, we really need to have our own fundraising apparatus. We're setting that up right now. So what we're really asking for when it comes to the people who have the capacity to help us in a big way is talk with us, let us explain in greater detail what we're doing. Uh, out of that, if you feel it in your soul, like Ted did, uh, it, it, all we ask is that you, you pledge an amount to us. We will compile those pledges. Uh, when we sit down with Reed Brower uh, in the not too distant future, those compiled pledges, I think, will be enough to demonstrate to him that we are going to do this, we're for real. And if we embark then on a multi-month campaign, maybe you know through much of the rest of this year, uh, based on the response we're getting right now, we think Maine can once again lead the nation, you know, when it comes to demonstrating to people how important a component of our community's local news is. Now, some of the people watching this program are among the many consumers of newspapers in the United States who read a newspaper and say they're biased. Mm -hmm. They're biased, and I don't like it because uh, they don't reflect my views. And uh, often I hear people say, say uh, I won't read the Wall Street Journal because it's a Republican newspaper mm -hmm. and it's to the right, or I won't read the New York Times because it's a Democratic newspaper yep. and it's to the left. And if you read the opinion pages, there is a point of view, mm -hmm. and th th there is some accuracy to that. Mm -hmm. But if you read the news portions of those newspapers, which is most of the mm -hmm. paper, uh, they're just reporting facts, right. both of them. Right. The Wall Street Journal is very good reporting, excellent reporting. The New York Times, excellent reporting, and a lot of news mm -hmm. that's important. And people say about our newspapers, I hear mm -hmm. neighbors of mine, oh, I wouldn't read that because that's a left-wing rag, <laughs> okay? Well, I know Reed Brower. Mm -hmm. And I don't think he's, no, no, he no, thinks no. that way at all. I don't all. think so. I don't think no. he's that. And I think that a lot of that is, uh, it has to do with uh, not hearing what you want to hear. Yeah. Uh, and, and there is a bit of a uh, shoot the messenger syndrome there whenever a controversial, yeah. particularly a controversial story comes out. Uh, but all I can tell people is that we adhere to that process I described in detail before. And uh, we are, uh, as for the purposes of our organization, we are, we are heavily at work, in addition to the fundraising. Uh, we're a small board, there's three of us so far. We, we plan on expanding that to 
anywhere from seven to 12 people. And I am involved right now in active recruitment of potential board members. And we are, we are very determined that that board uh, reflect the entire diversity of Maine, whether it's geographic, cultural, uh, you know, go down the line. So uh, all, all the different things that you're looking to try to get as representative a group of people as we can. Uh, I've got three very well-known Republicans. I'm not going to tell you who they are because I, you know, I, that wouldn't be proper, but uh, who are on my list right now of people who, at least one of whom, I would hope even two of whom, would be willing to sit on our board. We are not about uh, building a, an echo chamber, be it to the left or to the right here. We're about an organization that will truly reflect this changing state, I should say. It's not, you know, it ain't what it was 20 years ago. We both know that, a little over 40 years ago, and we both know that. Uh, so we're, the face of the Maine Journalism Foundation as it emerges from this first phase is going to, I think, impress a lot of people with the breadth. Of well, the one people. thing we know, a foundation does not have political views. That's right. Not allowed. So, so that takes mm -hmm. care of that problem. Yeah. But, but, you know, anecdotally, I want to make an observation here. Uh, for decades, Guy P. Gannett owned these newspapers. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I was toward the end of uh, the last 25 years of the Gannett, own, Gannett family owning these newspapers, I was kind of avocationally in politics in Maine. Mm -hmm. I was a Democrat. Uh, and the Gannett newspapers of the Democrats said, oh, well, the Gannett's are Republicans. And they were. They were. For all the years, or many of the years, 22 or three years, that Guy Gannett owned the newspapers, his wife served all of those years as a member of the Republican National Committee. There you go. Didn't bother Good people. history, Harold. I well, like it's that. a fact. Yeah, yeah. She did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't bother me mm -hmm. because I read the newspapers and I didn't think anybody was sitting around saying, oh, let's change that yeah. story yeah, right. so it favors the Republicans. Mm -hmm. no, no, they were no. just tr asking people questions, taking notes, and right. reporting to the right. public what was going right. on. Yeah, two things. One, that what, they, what people are reflecting there very often are the editorial views taken by the newspaper as opposed to the uh, news mm -hmm. reporting. And that's still an open question here. People say, well, will the, will, can a, how can you editorialize if you're a nonprofit newspaper? And it's a very good question because the rules that come with that nonprofit tax exempt status pr preclude that kind of activity. Uh, there, there are some models, we haven't decided on one yet, but there are some models, for example, where the, the, the owner, the <coughs> owning entity, in this case the foundation, which would be a nonprofit organization, uh, can own a for-profit B Corp, which is basically a public benefit corporation that is in, in existence to satisfy the public good as opposed to, you know, make just plain and simple make money. So there are pro still options where newspapers can editorialize and, and uh, you know, do some of the traditional things that they've done. We haven't, as I said, we're, we're not far enough. We, we have very professional advisors. We have a guy named Carlos uh, Burio Nuevo from the public media company who is in very, he, he actually, the, I mentioned that deal down in Pennsylvania. He was very pivotal in that, which just closed, I think, this What's past What's the week. deal in Pennsylvania? That's where the, the family newspaper went to the public, TV, the public broadcasting and they merged. He was very instrumental in that. He was also involved in the Chicago situation. So that's a merger of the local newspaper and the public, public broadcasting. broadcasting. They're one now. They're one yeah. newsroom. Okay. In, in Chicago, uh, WBZ and the Chicago Sun-Times have done the same thing. Carlos was involved in this, <clears> so <throat> we really value his expertise here. And he's telling us, uh, you know, get, get in the door and then we'll talk about organization because there are many options and a lot of them depend on what's best for this market. Well, yeah, there are, there are uh, you know, huge number of options. First of all, there's no requirement that if the nonprofit owns the newspapers that they have to take an editorial stance on no, anything. that's right. That's true. And in fact, yeah. you could invite people with different points of view yep. to each 
every, three days a week. Debate it. Debate it. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I wanted to make one other point because you, you mentioned Guy Gannett again. Yeah. And I can't tell you how important it is that Matty Corson, who was the last Gannett publisher of these papers, back going up to the late 90s when the Gannett family sold to the Seattle Times, another family-owned operation. Uh, Maddie, I can't tell you how endeared she is to this day to those of us who worked in those newsrooms over the decade. We were at lunch the other day. Can I just say, Guy, I, Guy Gannett, I believe, oldest grandchild. Grand, granddaughter, that's correct. And, uh, go, grandchild, yeah. oldest grandchild. Yeah. And she... Uh, she reminded me of how her job. She 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 she's she does she she really is too modest when she talks about the impact she had on these newspapers during her tenure. And uh, but what she says is she was she was the hugger. That was her job. <laughs> Our job was to put out the news. Her job was to come down to the newsroom and give us all hugs. <laughs> and she hasn't changed a bit. But Mary Maddie's name carries. Tremendous weight in this community. She is so universally respected, not just for her work for the newspaper, but for her philanthropy, Children's Museum, uh, most recently. She has done miracles in this community. So that when she, at this point in her journey, told us that she was willing to serve, uh, we, we approached her, could you be our honorary campaign chair? Because your name alone carries such weight and influence that that would really help us. She immediately said she would, and a little while into that now, I'm, I'm going to try to strip her of that honorary title because I am on the phone with her three times a day right now, and she is working the phone. She's doing all those things that she's so good at, and I just can't tell you how much that means to us, how important it is, and how it brings this full circle. You know, it ties us into that rich newspaper legacy that we have in Maine, and to have it spearheaded by somebody like Maddie is just perfect. Yeah, I, 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 I agree with you. Mm. Uh, incidentally, I've known Maddie, she was known as Maddie Jean when I mm -hmm. knew her, yep. uh, since I was about 10 years old. Ah. Because she, okay, well, we, well, we, we, we lived in the same neighborhood, one yep. street apart. Okay. Yeah, yep. so yep. Uh, I, I'm a little bit older than her. So I'm a little bit older than everybody, but yeah. she's included. Wouldn't know it, Harold. Yeah. So, uh, Bill, the, uh, how it comes together, we're flexible, but uh, the nonprofit seems to be the way definitely this yes. is going to go. Yes, I mean, go. Maine Journalism Foundation will be a nonprofit mm -hmm. no matter what. And we will be around no matter what. <laughs> we hope to pull this off. If perchance it doesn't work out for whatever reason, uh, maybe much like what you see in, in Baltimore, we're going to stick around. We're going to keep looking for ideas and ways. But honestly, as I said before, now's the time. If we really want to maintain what we have, protect it, grow it, preserve it, now is the time. And, and I, I, I don't want to sound overly dramatic about that, but the fact is, Given the way things played out this winter and spring, uh, we are operated, operating under a, a very uh, tight timeline right now. So we ask, uh, we ask that, that folks think about this, but at the same time, we ask that you don't think forever about it. Because as I said in the column a week ago Sunday, uh, this is a call to action. Well, isn't it true that there are these, um, there are these predator uh, organizations, private equity funds, that are in the business mm -hmm. of squeezing and killing local journalism uh, for profit, uh, are already showing some interest? Yes, I, I, I think that's fair. Yeah. I, yeah. Again, I don't have, I'm not privy to conversations that go beyond the ones we're having with Reed, but I have been watching the, uh, the news environment closely enough, long enough now to know exactly what's going on out there. And uh, it, uh, you don't need a crystal ball to know that they're circling right now. And uh, we need to see where they come down on this. I mean, we, maybe as I mentioned earlier about the real estate disincentive in yeah. this case, you know, who knows? We don't, we don't know what it's going to look yeah, like. I mean, there, there's no real estate here for them to 
cash in squeeze on. out yeah, squeeze that's out right. yeah but there but there is uh, there are people and 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 as I've always believed when it comes to journalism it's not about the buildings folks beautiful as the press what is now the press hotel down on Congress Street here might be and what an, a historic landmark it might be that's not the soul as you described it of the community as a building the soul is the people who worked inside there and the people who still work inside that newspaper. And those are the people in this scenario who would be squeezed first. And it's not only unfair to them and their livelihood, but more broadly, it's unfair to the whole community. And they're the ones who are shining the light. Exactly. Making the sunshine that disinfects corruption and scandal and all the other bad things that can happen in a local community. Exactly right. They're shining the light. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as you point out, it can go to darkness very quickly. It can. And it will change everything in the community. Mm -hmm. And people will be able, people in power will then say, they'll never find out. That's right. You know, an interesting side to that, there was a study done, I wish I could remember the university that did it, but uh, they did a study of uh, municipal borrowing rates in communities that lose their newspapers, the interest rates go up. Because the lenders are worried that there's trouble? Precisely. Could, we, won't, we don't know what's going That's on, right. say the lenders. It's like saying, this, this bank has a guard. <laughs> this bank has a security guard at the door. This one doesn't. Where are you going to put your money? Yeah. You know, and it's the same phenomenon. So it does have a lot of unexpected real-world consequences when you lose your newspaper. But you're right, the, the one that troubles me most is the, is the, the prospect of these uh, government officials, elected and otherwise, who can gather for a public meeting, and I've seen this, in a public meeting place to conduct their public business, and they might as well be in executive session. You know why? Because there's no one there. There's sure. no one there. And, the, and very often, conversely, when you have a robust, active newspaper, there's one person there, and it's that reporter. I have been a lawyer for 55 years. I've done a lot of administrative law. I've appeared before boards, commissions, and otherwise. And I can tell you, they're all inclined to hide things. Yep. It's just instinct to hide it, to keep the public out, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I, I, I am. I believe this is essential, and I'll just wrap up by saying it sounds like it's about 15 minutes until midnight. There you go. It is. Thanks. Harold, thank you so much. Thank I you really for coming. I really appreciate the opportunity.